Where's your favorite place to take college game day? And I say every time, Eugene, Oregon. Welcome, Ducks fans. Where and whenever you're watching or listening, this is the Once a Duck podcast, where we bring you up to date with current and former University of Oregon athletes and give you never before heard stories about some of your favorite teams and moments in Ducks history. And Sam, you and I were at the game. I'm your host, Nick Cody, and all of you, almost all of you that have listened to Once a Duck, I think, came up reached out to me at the Fresno State game and said, what's up? So that means you're probably already following us at Once a Duck or at Just Follow, at Just Follow 6-1 or my man Sam at Samuel 101 TS. Sam, what was it like being back in Austin Stadium for that first game in over 600 days? Nick, it felt phenomenal. It was so much fun. I don't know about you. I know you came down the morning before, but I had to tell you, I showed up to Austin Stadium about 7.30, 8 o'clock the night before, ended up checking out a good amount of the Oregon soccer game. After that, was able to move on over to the stadium property, pitched a couple of tents, stayed out all night long, waited until the gates opened at 9 a.m. Soon enough, I found myself in the front row at Autzen Stadium. A little bit of body paint later, we were having a grand old time. It was a fun game. The Ducks were able to do what they needed to do. It wasn't always pretty, but the result we were all hoping for came to fruition in Oregon victory. Man, and it certainly did. And I had a, a, an amazing experience. Number one, reached out on Twitter, which we hope you're already following us on or subscribed on YouTube. And I just said, hey, I'm looking at possibly going down to the game. I don't know if I necessarily had a ride. And longtime follower of the show and now one of our inaugural Once a Duck VIPs at Rabin Ducks, uh, Raven Ducks, sorry, uh, the the fantastic Mike, as I know him, was able to give me a ride down to Lin from Linwood to Vancouver the night before. And then I came down to Eugene uh, that very morning and man, oh, came in. And before I even crossed the bridge over the Willamette, I'm offered by two young men ready to go the opportunity to shotgun a Bud Light. Did I take it? Of course I did. Because one of those young men, it was his first opportunity to be at Austin Stadium for a game. And I had to oblige. I didn't shotgun it. I just tried to drink it as fast as I could to match them shotgunning it, but I appreciated it nonetheless. And then standing in line, waiting for a beer, uh, multiple people came, recognized me, said, what's up, either recognize me for being a Husky hater number one up around here or for the podcast, both of which I appreciate, but I only had to pay for one beer, which blows my mind and I appreciate all of you guys that were able to make that experience happen for me, but especially Mike, I am going to crown you our inaugural Once a Duck VIP member and want to let all of you guys know that you can be an inaugural Once a Duck VIP through our new program we're offering. So we'll talk about that a little bit later in the episode and uh, also going to give you guys another review session like we talked about last that's going to make a good Another appearance, we're going to go into the film room, study some fantastic plays from Oregon's past. We're going to have a great interview with Jeff Schwartz that you are going to love. I'm excited for it. Sam, what do you think? It was an absolute pleasure to be able to speak with Jeff. We were able to record a little bit earlier in the day. He was such a pleasure to talk to. Everybody's going to really enjoy that. Yeah, but also we got to get back to our roots and uh, establish this routine that we're going to have. The lightning yellow round. I should have figured this out last week. Lightning yellow round. That's how we're going to get down in two minutes or less of just explaining what we saw from the last game and uh, our expectations, our predictions versus what we saw in the field versus Fresno State. Sam you, Sam, you start us off. Go ahead. First and foremost, one of the things that stuck out to me the most, and I wrote it on Twitter the next day, the importance of Kayvon Thibodeau in this Oregon defense. He stood out like a sore thumb when he was playing, and it was worse when he wasn't. 
it was absolutely apparent the amount of pressure he was able to put on the quarterback, as well as what he was able to do in the run game. Oregon's defense with and without him is that much difference. Are there other playmakers? Tons. More coming back this week. That being said, Thibodeau, he is what they say he is. Watch out for it. Him at 100% means this Oregon defense can do whatever it wants. Yeah, and he had some fantastic plays early, and when he was gone, he was definitely missed. But the guy that definitely stepped up was Justin Flo, uh, named Pac-12 Player of the Week earlier uh, for, uh, you know, having that limited opportunity last year to get in games and getting injured. Uh, man, he sure showed out. He had 14 tackles and one forced fumble. And, man, every play he made, he was getting the entire crowd fired up. I loved it. It was phenomenal to watch. Justin Flo is one of those guys who has the potential to do whatever he wants to. That is such a valuable thing to have in a player. Another place where I saw guys doing whatever they wanted to, the Oregon offensive line. They looked so strong and dominant at certain times in this game. There was pressure nonstop, and they were able to do well. One thing that impressed me almost more than anything, Alex Forsyth goes down, starting center. What is going to happen? A true freshman steps up in that moment, It's fantastic, looks great, doesn't seem like a problem at all. That's exactly what you're hoping for. When you're not mentioning the names, that's a good thing. His name didn't get mentioned because he was playing a phenomenal game. And that name is uh, Jackson Powers Johnson. You beat me to it. I wanted to mention him a little bit later, but it was great to see the guys that filled in those backup roles for the injuries that did happen during the game. And that's something that's just, we can just attribute to the depth that Mario Cristobal has built and the way we can wrap our lightning yellow round man two minutes right there we tried to get our ideas out but we can't fully encompass all the things we know you guys want us to talk about but before we get to that and all of the things you guys have tweeted at us that we have to get to let's just go back and explain this uh new inaugural program that we're having so if you donate five dollars right now either venmo or cash app you can help once the duck because right now we're uh, we're giving you guys so much content, you know, about an hour an episode that we have a backlog of episodes on SoundCloud uh, right now that require hosting. And our YouTube just is not generating revenue yet. We're almost at 100 subscribers. Hope you subscribe below right now if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're not, why not? You're missing out. We're going to give you guys visuals later on that you're going to have to only see on YouTube. So for now, you can make a $5 donation in the month of September 2021. And you can be on our VIP list. That What's that going to mean, Sam? I think we're going to give people a lot of extra opportunities to get the show early, maybe even 24 hours early. As soon as it's uploaded, you're going to get Once a Duck before everybody else at its typical 3 p.m. Thursday, Friday release window. Also, you're going to get exclusive live one-on-ones with either me or Sam during possibly the games. And it's going to help us generate even more revenue for our... Uh, swear jar here which every time we get full up with a significant amount we will go ahead and get an item to raffle off to those vip members specifically now when we get into october moving forward we'll have different parameters for non-inaugural members but get in now we appreciate it if you support the show and everything additional we get back is going to go right into the same area as the swear jar and give right back to making this show better sam what do you think about it and what's your what, what's your appeal about this and what do you what do you have for the fans out there? Nick, I mean at this point it just makes sense. Look, we're not going to lie to either one of us are paying our bills with this. But if we can take care of a SoundCloud bill, take care of a Dropbox bill, maybe just make it a little bit easier to make this show happen for all of you, that would make it a million times easier for each of us. Plus, what's the harm of one beer at a game every now and then? Exactly. And hey, Every now and then, we we ju- we will give it back to you guys in some form or the other. Maybe upgrades to Sam's set here, which go ahead and explain to the people out there why uh, usually you're still on top of it, getting that same unique Sam set. But let us know what you're going through right now and why it's so difficult. Well, at the moment, I, I, I'm currently, although it looks like I'm in a bunker somewhere, it looks like I'm underground ready for the nuclear war to break out. In reality, I'm in an apartment that's empty. I'm in the process of moving. This happens August, September, in most college towns. Leases run up. So I'm just in the process of being able to go from one apartment to the other. Would love to be able to set up the new studio just as well as Nick did. So, hey, if you guys want to help out with that, it'd be more than appreciated. Hey, and you know what? 
the the biggest bonus that you're going to get out of that is you're going to get priority responses from us and we're considering setting up some kind of a discord or private group for you guys to get all the answers to your twitter questions because we've gotten to the point the response of our last episode we can't answer them all so we've got to pick the best and if you're a vip we want to treat you with the highest priority and answer your question even if we already answered in previous episodes so first and foremost uh inaugural member at raven ducks you're my favorite i i have to give it to you because you wouldn't take gas money uh so you're you're number one number two or one a is at kleenex and uh donate he tweeted at us and said donated some hosting gets expensive quick which we agree with uh he said i've got a question for everyone even guests what's your pregame routine players and fans alike have their own routines what is unique about yours and go ahead and hit us in the comments down below or reply to us on twitter at kleenex if you want to and let him know because uh Sam, you and I have some very distinctly different pregame routines. I think uh, mine, mine, mine's been consistent between being a player and as a fan. But what's it like for you being up there at the front of the student section? How do you get there? Well, Nick, it, it requires a lot of dedication and a willingness to skip tailgates, which is a very hard thing for me to become comfortable with. That's why I'm so happy to go on a road game and be able to party with any and all Duck fans that are there and that are willing to. Because on game days, not only does the gate hour does the gate open two to three hours before the game, which is typical, which is still pretty early, probably a lot earlier than most fans are getting in the building. You have to get in line two, three, four, sometimes even five hours before that. I remember when Stanford played at Oregon to start the Pac-12 season in 2018. We at 7 p.m. at night went to game day, stayed out at game day all night went immediately from the game day set over to Autzen Stadium to sit out in front of the building all day before being finally let in at 3 p.m. for a 5 p.m. ball game. That's pretty typical. I'm not saying that it's always that little sleep, but it's about that. Very minimal sleep, a lot of coffee. When you see us in that front row, it's because we are amped. It's because we care. Say what you will about students. It's true. Sometimes you will get a little bit of emptiness at the very end of a game. Sometimes in the preseason, it won't fill up on the way. The kids that are there at the front, they care more than anybody in the building who isn't wearing a jersey, and I can guarantee that. Well, and you certainly weren't wearing a jersey. I think you weren't, you weren't wearing much of anything. Uh, go ahead and tell me how that worked out for you. Well, you know, Nick, we were trying to think about how could we bring in the new football season? What would be a fun way? We figured it was going to be 80 degrees and we were probably already going to get heat stroke anyway. So why not just throw on the body paint, get a nice little U of O across all of us. There's only four of us there. We were getting it started in the preseason nice and slow. Maybe something bigger to come throughout the year. We'll see. Possibly a costume party come October. We'll see what's going on. Maybe, maybe I'm giving you Oregon fans a little look ahead. It'll be a fun time. That being said, this last week, terrific time in the preseason you're just reuniting with all the kids that have been there some of the freshmen who are coming down for their very first game of students it was a great time nick i know you've got some very important very special traditions why don't you tell everybody about some of the more meaningful things that come to your heart during game day well when i'm not shotgunning beers over the willamette river <laughs> what a dichotomy. Uh, <laughs> uh, Man, so one tradition I've had ever since I was a player and something Chip implemented that uh, I, I think started with co strength and conditioning coach Jim Radcliffe was touching the O twice when we came in on game day was huge for us. And every game day, every night at the hotel, every away game, uh, I found a way to bring my dad along with me in the form of these compressed ashes into this orb. And uh, I've talked about it a few times in news stories, but uh, it's got dad and then the day my dad passed away etched right into there and uh it was always important for me to be holding this uh in my hand as we got off the bus and going through the march victory uh and as i was fist bumping many of you fans out there with my right hand i had this in my left hand and as soon as i got to that oh touch it twice i got a nice little loud ding out of it too i used to appreciate and i still do that on game day and uh as i was looking for sam uh i found a good opportunity i, I went up first was trying to locate him in the student section and then decided oh man he might he might be at the duck store so i used that opportunity in between there to go take that moment touch the o twice and uh it's uh as chip kelly would like to say it, it's not superstition it's just routine so it wasn't it wasn't anything but hey 
I, uh, I've lost a very few games, uh, only one as a starter in aughts and when I've done that. So some I stick with and uh, always take my dad with me on all big trips. And it's always been really important to me. Awesome. And, uh, you know, no matter what happens with the Ducks, I think that's going to be a tradition that holds. Well, now that we're all sentimental and, and, and feeling real feelings as opposed to our, our normal fun routine, Nick, thank you. We can get back into the normal show a little bit. So, Nick, why don't you take us into the next thing? We've got some more questions coming in. I know that we've had a couple so far. Do we have more from Twitter that you want to get to, or do you want to kick it over to the couple that I have uh, left over for you? Well, let's get one from you uh, from Twitter, and then uh, I've got one from YouTube, I think that will be pretty good. All right, the one I've got to go with from Twitter is from a brand new follower on the social media for myself. I think you as well, as well as the Once a Duck page, which I very much appreciate. And it's a name that I'm going to get wrong. So when you see the jump cut in the video, you're going to know because I edited it to make myself look better. So here we go. At A. Cernetescu, I'm going with it. Forget it. I'm calling I it like it. Thank I like you. it. Thank I had you. the swear jar ready in hand just in case. But Oh, no, we'll get, we'll get grief about it afterwards. But, you know, it's fine. He asks a, uh, a, a multi-pointed question that I'll, I'll take a run at and then I'll leave it, leave it off to you. He says, everyone is saying that our staff looked terrible. And I understand it was the first game, but is the offensive line a huge worry against Ohio State? Also, can you guys please talk about the two suspended players and how they're impacting the Ohio State game? Thank you. Well, I'll take a, a quick run at it. As far as the offensive line, don't worry. Cristobal knows what he's doing. If Cristobal knows anything, it's offensive line. He's got guys in place that will be able to figure it out. Uh, there could be, obviously, any potential issue against a team with the caliber of players that Ohio State has. You're going to have an issue anywhere on the field. They're that good of a team. It's going to happen. That being said, as far as Oregon's offense is concerned, I think we saw an exceptionally stripped-down version of what the Oregon offense can look like. I think we saw about three or four sets all game long, offensively and defensively as well. I think Oregon did not want to put a lot on tape. A lot of people seem to be of that mindset, and I think that it makes a lot of sense to not want to do such. As for the two suspended players, look, it always has, it always has an impact when you can bring guys of that caliber back into the room. DJ James, Jamal Hill, exceptional players. We saw the plays Jamal Hill was able to make in the Pac-12 championship game last year. DJ James is a lockdown guy. He'll be able to get out there on the outside for you, cause some problems. Regardless of what's happening within the program, when these guys are on the field, they are an absolute problem for an offense to handle. Anytime you can bring that level of talent back into a locker room, it's helpful. Nick, what's your take on both of these two topics? Yeah, starting with the offensive line, I think a lot of the things that I saw, especially more, more so on the replay uh, on Pac-12 networks, which isn't the greatest. We'll get into that. But uh, uh, it's tough because Fresno State really threw the kitchen sink at our offensive line. It felt like there was movement on every single play. There were a lot of pass protections that would have been pretty normal uh, week one issues that got expanded upon because of the timing at quarterback and because of the, the movement, particularly a lot of twisting, a lot of blitzes combined with uh, moving defensive linemen that picked off uh, you know, our offensive line. And having that extra week to play against UConn definitely factored into that. And uh, those were things that that offensive line has probably never seen on tape before and is going to have to work through. But they worked through it, wasn't all bad. And when you see the finish at the end of the game, the finish that we'll talk about later with George Moore that got the final touchdown of the game from Anthony Brown. I mean, that's the finish we need to start seeing from every single player that's out there on the field, every play. I think some of the times I saw from the offensive line, it was frustrating for me as a player because I've been there and I see my own tape, especially as a senior, like we talked about last week, where I'm not fully giving it my all. I'm jogging at the end, watching the play happen. And that's really not what you need. And we'll, we'll talk about it later when we go to our film study. But when you are really just balling out as an offensive lineman, you are going for any possible block you can get. You're not standing there watching. You are diving at people's legs, trying to spring that extra little block that takes something from a 10-yard run to a 70-yard touchdown. And 
I just didn't see it. There are guys that still need to understand that game tempo is game tempo. And I'm not talking about making stupid penalties or going and hitting somebody right when the whistle's blown, but you play to the whistle, you drive your guy into the ground and finish him. And if he can't make the play, you get up and you find someone else that can, and you get him knocked out, getting a little fired up about that, but it's offensive line play for you. And that's why we brought Jeff Schwartz on to talk shortly about some of those very same things and in regards to the players coming back. Uh, I just want to say I, I'm not sure I agree with a one-game suspension for obviously shooting people with a even an airsoft rifle. It's a very serious offense, and that could have gone a lot worse. Ultimately, it's, it's a good thing because our pass defense needed it. I felt very secure about our run defense. And early when we were getting pressure on Hainer, uh, which we still got to him, hit him sometimes late throughout the game, and props to him, really, really tough quarterback and uh, probably the only former Husky I'll root for this season. But, man, it was one of those things where, yeah, two more bodies out there I would like to see uh, in the defensive backfield to hopefully get a, a better better management on the passing game because there were times where he picked us apart and, uh, a lot, you know, props to him again, stood there in a tough pocket in a tough environment where a lot of quarterbacks would have folded especially with the hits early and the turnovers early. But Fresno State gave us their all, and uh, I think we got their best effort. And I think the team's only going to get better for it, and especially those backups that came in. You know, the reps that Swinson got in this game, I got to say, are going to go a long way this season. And, you know, Thibodeau, he's got he's got this season, and then everyone knows that he's going to be a draft pick. So we got to get those guys developed. Uh, Funa played pretty good, aside from a couple, you know, I believe a penalty there. I, I, I'm really excited for our defense, but man, on both sides, we got to finish. We got to finish plays and we got to be smart. We got to quit, you know, having penalties that we don't need. And as we've seen in many college football games, that's going to be something we all need to adjust to as everyone gets back into live game speed, which many teams have, you know, if you only had six games last year, it's going to translate very, very differently versus a team that was playing in either this spring or, you know, got some games in last year, maybe even more than Pac-12 did. So ultimately that's my takeaway. And I think that's a great question. Moving on. we got to go to, you have some of that? No, 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 no. Sorry. I was taking a deep breath. You're good. (laughs) Okay. Awesome. I love those deep breaths. I'm going to have to take one before we go to our first big YouTube comment to respond to. And Thank you guys for going and watching on YouTube. We hope you gave that video a like. Go back, watch the rest of our catalog, and, and subscribe so you get notifications about when we release new videos. But if you comment there, you might get priority if you're not a VIP. So something to consider. And we get a lot of great questions there so far. Going we back. We love the YouTube interaction. Absolutely. Or YouTube. Run up the algorithm. Dylan Thomas Finnegan said, hey, guys, love the pod and the videos. Been bidging leaning up to this season. I don't know if it's been asked before, but this one's for Cody. I think Sam's actually more qualified for it looking at it. The uniforms. How are the combos selected? Is it player votes? Do the staff pick them or does the equipment staff pick them? So in my time, as Chip explained it, it was a uh, – Casey Martin, the golf coach that was picking all our uniform combinations when I was actually playing, when I was a freshman redshirting, had no input. Supposedly, Bilotti gave the seniors the ability to choose the combos. I don't know how true that is. I didn't have the insight because I was a lowly freshman just redshirting, but I liked all the ones they picked. So went with it and uh, I I thought they did pretty well, but also thought besides my uh, Redshirt freshman year against Utah. I thought Casey Martin did a really good job now. Sam, I think you have more insight into what's going on now. I mean, I can't sit here and claim I'm an expert. I'm no equipment manager by any means. From everything I've heard and everything I know, though, the guy in charge of football, Mario Cristobal, he could care less. It is not his concern. He went to Miami in the 90s. All they wore was orange and white. He coached at Alabama. All they wore was red and white. He doesn't care. That's not his concern. He's going to leave that up to his captains, his seniors, and, of course, Kenny Farr. Kenny Farr, Oregon's head equipment manager, in charge of all of that fun stuff. He'll get together with those group of guys, as far as I know. They'll come up with their combos throughout the season. And you know what? If week one is anything to go off of, they know what they're doing. That was a beautiful combination to start the season. The yellow, green, yellow, it it really never looks bad, but they absolutely knocked it out of the park. I think this week we're going to see something pretty special too. Probably a lot of white, I would imagine. They're on the road, but we're probably going to be able to see some other cool things as well. 
yeah, I really enjoyed the uniforms and yeah, everything they've been doing. And hopefully we can get somebody in the design aspect, like a former player, Daryl Hawkins on the show sometime, but eh, just, just looking in the future. So some guests we'd like to have on, but we'd still love to know who you guys would like to have on first. So let us know, Sam, I think we've got room for one more tweet before we get to our special guest. Uh, you got anything for us? Well, you know what? I got to give it up to my hand, my man, Hayden right here. Let's go with Hayden Abel. He has a question for you. It is about the Oregon quarterback situation. This kind of led Oregon football Twitter on fire a couple weeks ago. I don't really think there was anyone who didn't at least throw their two cents into the mix. He asks, what are our thoughts on the Oregon quarterback situation after week one? Did Oregon fans overreact? Was Twitter valid to freak out? What are your guys' thoughts? Nick, I'll let you kick this one off. Oh, man. Well, that's a tough one because – uh, as I believe our guest Jeff Schwartz will explain, I, I think the offensive playbook is very limited. I don't think we saw at all the amount of RPOs that that Moorhead has really built into this offense. And we didn't see the tight end utilization I expected. We saw some fantastic blocks from some of our tight ends and receivers. And we really tried to establish the run. But the problem is, is Fresno State was selling out to stop the run and create disruption up front with their movement, with all their different gaps and pressures. And it was very, very interesting to watch how we responded to that. And I honestly thought Anthony Brown did a better job than most people are, are, are saying. And if you look at the stats, we really didn't try and challenge the defense downfield yet or through the RPOs, which could improve his stats significantly. Although I still felt at times that there were miscues in terms of timing that just felt unacceptable uh, when you're playing this style of offense. And I know a lot of people are, are very confused about calling it the pistol or kind of spread. There's, there are a lot of options in this offense and it's going to take a lot of the watching this season to see which progressions we use. Saw about six run plays. I really liked how we utilize speed option and set it up, especially because that got us the game winning touchdown, but Oh, it was uh, it was very difficult to watch because we didn't put the quarterback in a lot of really easy pass friendly situations. If you're running the ball and trying to establish the run on first and second down, you're got to be picking up yards or you're going to put your quarterback in a situation where, you know, seventh and long you know, or longer, uh, you know, seven yards or longer on third down, that's going to be really difficult to pick up just in the passing game. And if you're, you're already setting up, you know, the defense to know what you're going to be doing. It, it was tough to see. And there were a couple, you know, throws behind the line of scrimmage. You just wish he could have back. And I think, honestly, if you saw the video with coach Aliotti talking to him at the end, it really, it really changed my mind about, you know, do we sub next week if anything goes bad? I think we stick with Anthony Brown moving forward. And I, I honestly think give him more opportunities to run that set up and establish instead of just read option plays. So uh, there were a few times there where it felt like he was taking unnecessary hits and that might have affected the throwing game. I want to see more runs that are set up that you know it's going to be a pull uh, the read option is definitely effective, but there were times in my offensive days with Coach Kelly that we had established quarterback runs, and I think he is really set up for some of those. I think it's a very good point, Nick, and I think that is a place in the game where Oregon can definitely utilize a guy like his talents. I think if we're going to talk about the Oregon quarterback situation, you just have to be frank. The reason Anthony Brown is playing is because the coaching staff realizes – he presents the least possibility of catastrophic mistake. Yeah. And that's an okay thing. It's okay to be in that position to say, we have such terrific guys in the backfield, such studs up front, such talent on the outsides, that we just need somebody who's not going to fuck this thing up. And I think that that's a very valid idea to go into a game with. You've got yeah. tons of talent on the bench. You've got worlds of possibility to come. But for right now, what do you need? You need the guy who's smart, who's been there, who's had to make these decisions before, and who's probably, when it comes down to it, going to pull that ball for himself, scamper 20-something yards, and get into the end zone for a game-winning touchdown. That's the kind of play you want your starter to make. After the game, you mentioned it. He talked with Coach Aliotti, and that, that meant a lot to me. It showed me a lot, and it showed me a guy who wasn't content with his performance. That's what means something to me. When you have a guy who can go out there and make these decisions and go out there and do what he needs to do, but also looks at himself in the mirror at the end of a game and says, I need to be better. If this team is going to be better, it needs to be me. I love that. That's who you need leading you into battle. 
if nothing else, maybe maybe the guy who's starting isn't the guy who's going to throw it absolutely the furthest one, absolutely the fed. Maybe it's the guy who's going to go out there and play the best football game for you. I think that's who's starting at quarterback for Oregon. Yeah, and we'll see how things play out at Ohio State, but I honestly think if you can keep him safe and upright but still man- manage to get those yards we need to get from the quarterback position out of the run game, it seems, uh, he's going to be someone we're going to have to stick with. And until otherwise, then you, then you put in subs. But I think you stick with him for now. And, you know, honestly, uh, besides, you know, as we came out of shout, the turnover right there at the fourth quarter was a little, uh other than that, I thought he did a good job protecting the football. And honestly, there were times I wish he ran more where, you know, he might have taken a throw that he just hesitated a little bit on before when he could have just scampered for an easy first down. So, yeah, well, you know, we're not the best experts at breaking it down. I know we're going to give it a try later, but our next guest, man, he sure knows how to break it down and can't wait to hear from Jeff Schwartz. Joining us now is former Duck Jeff Schwartz. And earlier this week, uh, you announced in addition to your podcast, you'll be back with Fox Sports. Congratulations and thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I'm glad to be back. We're doing some college football action as well this year. You know, we got a big game this week, so I'll be diving into Oregon, Oregon State. And uh, we'll have a lot of fun with this as usual. Yeah, in addition to your podcast and all the other great work you do, one of the things I love that I'm trying to incorporate in this show is some film breakdown. And when you bust out the spoon, there's nobody like it. What really got you into breaking down film for just the average fan? Yeah, well, part of it was I um, was tired of seeing people on Twitter really not understand offensive line play more than anything else. It's a position that unless you play it, it's really hard to understand, unless you dedicate your entire life uh, to studying, uh, it's it's hard to get. Like a guy like Brandon Thorne, who didn't play offensive line, but he has dedicated his life to the position. I mean that 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 he knows what he's talking about, right? So um, that is is why I like doing it. Uh, but I like teaching. Like I, it's fun to teach about the game. Teachers happening, and I think I do a good job of trying to do it in a way that people can understand um, and give them some inside information without being too uh, too wordy or too technical. Jeff, you mentioned that there's a lot of people who might not understand the nuances of the offensive line, particularly all the positions, what each one is doing. What do you think is one singular thing that people most either underestimate or don't think about when they reference an offensive line or the work that they do? Yeah, that all sacks are offensive linemen's fault. Um, That's not true. Uh, And in fact, I could argue that a lot of times it's, it's more the quarterback's fault than anything else. You know, it's a three-step drop. The guy's dropping too deep. Uh, you know, the quarterback's not doing what he's supposed to do. There's a, there's a balance, right? There's a, 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 a supposed to be a, a um, you know, a, 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 like, um, uh, uh, what, what's the right word to do? Like, it's like a symphony, right? Like, there's different places where people are supposed to be, different things people are supposed to do, and we're supposed to block, obviously, but the quarterback's supposed to be where the quarterback is supposed to be. And when he's not – we look stupid, we get blamed for the sack when it's not always our fault. Yeah. When you first came to Oregon, what was your understanding of offensive line play in terms of technical ability? And how did Coach Zoom and Coach Greatwood really bring you and bridge the gap to where you got to the NFL and then then furthered your understanding there? Yeah, so um, I didn't know much about the the position uh, before I got to Oregon. And I had Zoom for one year. And then Greatwood took over after that. And, you know, it wasn't until my senior year that I learned really a lot about the ins and outs of football in general, because Greatwood uh, did a great job of teaching us the game, right? I mean, I got the position. I understand it, but but, but what about the game, right? Because it was Chip's first year as OC, and we were so fast on offense that defense couldn't keep up with us. So we couldn't even watch practice film. It was impossible because there was nothing to watch. The defense couldn't line up quick enough for us to play. And so we spent all our time studying defense and studying safety rotation and where linebackers are at and the hash mark and why that matters and things like that. So I felt that I had a much, a much uh, better understanding of the game around me, which in in turn makes you play faster, right? If you know what a linebacker is going to do at the snap and you're supposed to block him kind of important, right? If you know where a defensive lineman is going to move before the snap and you got to block that guy, pretty, pretty important information. So I learned a lot of it my senior year when I was really allowed the opportunity to learn what's going on around my position. Jeff, before you got the opportunity to come to Oregon and learn as you did, there had to be a process in which you decided to even become an Oregon Duck. What did that look like for you? What was it like to go from being a high school kid to making that transition, coming to Eugene, becoming a Duck? 
Well, look, I grew up a UCLA fan. Uh, my parents were UCLA. I mean, that's where I should have gone. Uh, but obviously, uh, I didn't go there and ended up being, you know, being best uh, for me in the end. I, I really enjoyed Oregon. Um, and it was interesting. So when I got there, we had a giant offensive line class. So it was me, Max Unger, Jake Hucko, Mark Lewis, um, uh, Aaron Clovis. Uh, and there was one other guy. I'm pretty sure I'll be pissed if I don't remember. John T came in, but he's a walk-on. That might have been oh Jeff Kendall. So we had a lot. We had seven guys basically um, in that offensive line. Got six were on scholarship, and uh, you know, Aaron Clovis was the highest recruit Oregon I think ever had at that position. He ended up uh, not panning out in college. But uh, when my back then we did double days still, and the first couple of days we uh, we did like a morning practice with the veterans and afternoon practice with the young guys, something like that, or vice versa. And they needed one more tackle to play in the veteran group. And we literally draw, drew straws. Like we legit zoom. It was me and like, you know, and Hucko, I think, and Clovis, the three of us, because there were three tackles at the time. Um, and Unger, I think Unger was playing tackle then too. So three, four tackles. And I drew the shortest straw. So I went up and played with the older group and I did well. And that's why I play as a true freshman. Now, nowadays you play four games and you get the red shirt year. That, that wasn't the case. I only played 80 snaps my freshman season I uh, would love to have that back but it didn't happen that way and that's how I started playing was I just kind of got the short end of the straw played well and then uh you know I was a, a three-year starter after that by the time you were a senior man that 2007 year was special uh yeah. I was a recruit at the time and uh early committed but I was there uh for the real my favorite moment of your career was on my official visit when you caught a pitch uh, unexpectedly from Dennis Dixon yes. what's it what's it like in Austin Stadium to get that pitch unexpectedly and take it for three hard yards well I think it chips after the game that you know things are going well when you pitch the ball to an offensive lineman and you still win the game right I mean that wasn't supposed to happen that way all I remember so I remember a couple of things uh, obviously it plays out much faster um plays out much faster in, in real time, like you watch on film, then it played in my mind. I remember getting the pitch from Dennis. And again, I was, Dennis went the wrong way. It was a read option and he was supposed to go left and he went right. And I had blocked Lawrence Jackson and I was coming back. Uh, Lawrence was coming back in the play. So I was trailing to try to get back in the play. And Dennis saw me and pitched me the ball. Like I was the, the read option. So I caught the ball, which was pretty impressive nonetheless. But I remember it was Garen Strong, number 21, but 10 yards in front of me and his eyes were like, like his eyes, I'll never forget his eyes were like, oh my God, I cannot believe this guy has the ball. And I took, you know, I started running, obviously got three yards and third leading rusher that game. Uh, look in the stats, G Schwartz, three, three was, it was, uh, you know, it was Jonathan Stewart, Dennis Dixon and Jeff Schwartz. So um, I'll take, uh, I'll take it. It's kind of odd that I was the third leading rusher. Like we had two running backs, but I guess uh, maybe JJ didn't play that game. He was hurt. Um, but yeah, third leading rusher. Yeah, there was a moment I thought it was a recruiting pitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I mean, that, so we, so we, I think I was preparing for the bowl game. I think maybe the Sun Bowl 07 when, um, no, it wouldn't have been the case because Max was at center by then. It must have been in 2005 for the holiday bowl because Max was still left tackle. And we did practice a tackle, uh, a tackle screen for Unger. Oh, and um, we threw the ball. Uh, to max in practice and he was rubbing down the sidelines and someone hit the ball out from behind and that never that's i played he ruined it for everyone it's like Scrap never happened it. again never happened again i know panay sewell got a ball a couple years ago in a very weird spot i mean the, the, the in the pac championship game up seven nothing in the twice red zone. twice it was, it was very <laughs> odd for me to get the ball there but it's happened sometimes you know every now and then Jeff, you had the opportunity to witness a lot of Oregon's growth throughout the 2000s during a period of time where maybe people didn't see the most happening, but there was a lot happening underneath the surface that would lead to the success in the coming seasons. What was one thing that you saw in that team, whether it was a culture thing, whether it was a locker room thing, that showed you the direction the program was headed? Well, it definitely was the camp, uh, was it Camp Harrell? Har Harlow. Har Harlow. I've heard about this. The Camp Harlow night uh, that we had. So we you know, we had the Vegas Bowl in 06, and BYU kicked our ass. I mean, it was bad. It was like 38 to 8 or some crazy number like that. And so I remember in March, um, Chip sent a message. I forget, uh, not Chip, Bilotti sent a message. I forget how we got messages back then. Maybe it was a text or maybe it was an email. Like, hey, you guys are meeting at 7. We're meeting at 7 o'clock uh, at the facility. So... We met at night, we took some buses up to Camp Harlow and we sat down and we had this big, like, come to Jesus meeting with a team. Uh, Bilotti, 
uh, spoke. He said, hey, I want you guys to write me a letter of everything you think is wrong with the program, write with the program, whatever you want. We did that. And then he goes, hey, you know, we were at tables of about 12 uh, players, you know, from different position groups and coach at their own tables. And they're like, hey, I want you to write next. I want you guys to come together as a group. And we had big, big pieces of paper. I want you to write down everything that's wrong or do you don't do you don't like with the program. So we did that. We, we put them on the wall. And then each, you know, we had, you know, someone, I think you know, she might've been Kwame, who's their coach now uh, at Oregon. He might've been the guy who spoke for our group. He got up and said, you know, the 10 things, right? We're, we're, there's lack of accountability, you know, Bilotti, you're not, a, you know, there was like, you know, it just was, you know, Bilotti just kind of, it was the CEO, right? Just kind of roamed around. It was a lot of like, hey, you're not really doing anything here. Coaches don't respect blah, blah, blah. Then for the coaches, Greatwood spoke and he, he ripped into us for like 30 minutes as players. So then Bilotti said, look, let's talk about ways we can fix this, okay? And that's where Win the Day came from, all right? Win the Day came from that meeting. I know Chip claims that, and that's fine. I mean, he, he used it more than maybe Bilotti did. But Win the Day came from that. That It came from that. That was like Chip's second day on the job. I'm sure he loved being there when he had to go through this whole thing. Um, but we said, look, is if we're going to be a better team, we have to hold each other accountable, right? It's not about the big wins. It's about the little ones, right? It's doing everything right every day, every time, every moment you have in the weight room, uh, conditioning, practice, meetings. We're going to win each little moment. So I think, I think you know, to, to Bilotti's point that time, we were so worried about everything else, about where our rankings were and where our uniforms were and where, and, you know, who thought we were good, who thought we were bad, and the big picture. Win the Pac-12, just not, not doing little things. So, uh, that's that was pretty memorable because that, that spurned basically or, or spawned, I should say, uh, you know, basically a whole generation of Oregon football. Yeah, and former uh, once a duck guest Josh Rudy kind of mentioned Camp Harlow, but definitely didn't go into the detail. That's amazing to hear. Oh, cause... Shergy. Oh, boy. <laughs> go, going into your senior year, that was really a, a, a process that that come to Jesus moment showed immediately. The first game against Houston, you guys came out rolling. And then yeah. the second week, a play we're going to diagnose a little bit later in the film room. Uh, man, Michigan. And I think the, the plays that everyone remembers the most, the Statue of Liberty plays, right? What was that yeah. like? What do you remember from it? Take us through those. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I mean, I remember calling them, obviously. I don't remember, uh, I mean, I've seen the play a thousand times. I mean, the, the one to Stewart is pretty simple, but the one to, to Dennis, I just remember the camera guy and the announcer being like, oh, Dennis still has the ball. I mean, you know, we we were doing things at that time that no one else was doing. I mean, there, and there were teams that were up-tempo, but our tempo with our skill and our talent had not been done before. And, you know, in that game right there, I mean, we ran by Michigan. We ran over them, through them, by them, and the tempo was so fast. And so, yeah, we showed a Statue of Liberty. We came back and called again. And, and look, you didn't – and that and Nick, you were in this offense. Like, you didn't have time to think. There wasn't a time no to, idea. like – like, like you, you, the play's just called and you do it because – it was the tempo that that helped us win a lot. And it was a, it was a bit of a downfall in that. I think when you're playing better teams and, you know, Chip at times had trouble against LSU and Auburn, right? These bigger teams where you really, you do need to slow it down a little bit and kind of grind it out a tiny bit. And when you go so fast, you have a three and out, it's kind of hard on your defense a little bit. Um, you know, I hope Oregon can win this weekend, but it's a different team, obviously. But we had that problem with Ohio State in the championship game. It's just hard sometimes at that tempo to kind of beat like a, a big dog, a real big dog team. But against most teams, man, they, they they just don't know what hits them. And we just just keep rolling, rolling. And you don't have time to think. You, you really, you're just, you're playing fast. You mentioned the Michigan game. And I think it's a game that's really important to look back on, especially this week as Oregon heads into Ohio State. If for no other reason, then it's a collection of young men, 18 to 22, all heading into such an intense, hostile environment. What do you remember about walking into the big house, being surrounded by all that maze and navy, and then what do you expect out of this Oregon team? How can they go into this game in the yeah. horseshoe with the right mindset? Well, um, I just remember watching film that week because they had just been lost to App State, okay? And we thought we'd get their best effort. And we thought also, too, we're like, man, App State's kind of running by them. You know, maybe, maybe you know, that's just kind of like a fluke. Like Michigan just didn't come out and play hard. And lo and behold, they just, they were slow. And we ran by them during the game. I remember the weather was beautiful. It was like 80 degrees and... A little humid. So I'm fine with that, right? You, you know, you're able to, your muscles feel good. You feel loose, right? And then, but it wasn't sunny. It was like overcast and we just came out and kicked their ass. And it wasn't, it wasn't loud. The big house, I mean, Austin's 10 times louder. Just a big bowl of uppity fans. I mean, there was nothing, it wasn't loud at all. And, and the fans started booing the team very quickly. Um, it wasn't, it, it's not, 
I mean, it's cool because it's there's a lot of football history there, just like kind of the Coliseum is is cool in that way. But they're not. It's not a raucous atmosphere. Well, before we let you go, I want to definitely talk about this season's team, a little bit about your thoughts on Mario Cristobal and the new new wave of offensive linemen, I guess, talent that he's brought in on the recruiting trail and what you see going into this Ohio State game that they need to either fix from Fresno State or continue to improve on. Look, I obviously the recruiting is is at another level. Oregon, and I'll tell you, look at the Fresno game, how it paid off, okay? There were three turnovers forced on defense, all by five stars. What a surprise, right? Like, what a surprise. Um, that's the way it works, right, is, is you have a very talented team, and the very talented team does a lot of good things. Um, you know, this year, obviously, we're missing that quarterback piece, right? I mean, Anthony, uh, uh, Anthony Brown is okay. Um, I mean, I you know, we saw against Fresno – um, and I watched a film of that game, you know, run game RPO stuff was so limited. I think they're just hiding a bunch of things for Ohio state, especially in, in the RPO action off some of those runs. I mean, Fresno was selling out to stop the run unblocked safeties. I mean, things you just should handle against Ohio state and the passing game, Anthony Brown was just okay. Like he just was, he had some good, some bad, but it's just like his fourth year starting. He is what he is at this point. So I really wish that we were able to, to play young player now, but I'll tell you next year, is the year that I've targeted is like, we better be a playoff team because, you know, we will have now almost an entire roster full of four and five star players, right? Like we have a high level roster um, and we should be able to compete at that level starting next year, especially a quarterback. Right. I mean, I know Kayvon leaves. I, I get that. Um, but we still have a lot of really good football players on the team and we will be able to compete. I think at a national level, look, I hope Ty Thompson, is ready to go next year. Um, I mean, I was hopeful he was ready to play this year. Cause I just don't, I don't, a lot of things have to go right to beat, to, to beat Ohio state and Anthony Brown has to play better than he has in his career. And I hope that's the case. Obviously I'm rooting for it, but I, I don't know, man. Jeff, thank you so much for your time. It's an absolute pleasure to be able to talk to you. You've got so such a wealth of knowledge that we would love just to be able to learn just a little bit from the last thing I have to ask you heading into this week, Maybe not an exact score if you don't have one, but if you had a feeling for how this game was going to play out on Saturday, what do you got to say? I mean, Oregon has to win something like 35, 34. I mean, they can't allow in the forties. I don't think. Um, and look again, I'll just say this, you know, I think it's fair to say that Oregon has played down to opponents at times under Mario, right? Like he's terrible at covering games at home. Like he's like five and 14 covering the spread at home. But in big games, the team plays pretty well, right? He's being Chris Peterson twice at Washington. He's being USC twice in Pac-12. And the team last year wasn't that good, right? They, they smoked USC. Uh, they beat they beat Wisconsin in the Rose Bowl. Um, you know, they should have beat Auburn a couple of years. I think Mario learned from that game. You know, he kind of, at the end of that game, we know we kind of got to, I think he learned from that. Though at least he's coached differently in, in big moments since that game. Um, and then the Iowa State Bowl game last year, it was just a clusterfuck, right? I mean, I don't fucking cuss or not, but you know, the, that the kickoff that that goes over the guy's head and bounces back to Iowa State, I mean, it just was weird. Like, I don't think we were not prepared to play that game, right? We were we just well, we lost. Um, so I have faith that Oregon will be ready to play this game. I have faith that we will have an offense that's different than what we saw in week one, just because they have a ton of offense that they didn't show in this game. I know Joe Morgan has that offense. Can Anthony Brown? be something he's not i hope so right i hope there are op opportunities for him um look ohio state secondary and defense is their weak spot um and look we have if dj james is back which supposedly he's back this week him and mikhail wright and then obviously our linebackers are we, we have a chance to win this game so i'll go 30 I, I think if the ducks win it's something like 35 34 like it's going to be a in the 30s somewhere if they allow over 40 points probably not winning the game Wow. Well, you heard it there first, folks, and he's smarter than you, so you need to be following his <laughs> podcast. On, follow him on Instagram. That's my favorite. You're going to get the best highlights, not just in football. Thank you. But, but football applied in real life. Thanks for coming on, Jeff, and once a duck, always a duck. Thank you, guys. Have a great one. Thanks for having me. You too. Man, that might have been my favorite interview we've had so far, except, well, between Jeff and you, I think uh, we've got a couple contributions we need to make to our swear jar here. What do you think? Well, you know what? Um, I dropped one earlier that I didn't realize I dropped until after we stopped recording the first segment. And uh, Jeff might have dropped one or uh, maybe another one, but I'm only going to count the one. So, you know what? I'm going to contribute this this special edition. One of these, one of these, I, I, they're real, but like you only see them at kids' birthday parties. One of these fun 
Thomas Jefferson, $2 bills. Nick, put it in the swear jar. Give it off to whoever me, we're raffling this to. You, I don't think this is what you sent me, but hey, it all it's counts the magic the same. of Zoom. It's the magic of Zoom. It all counts the same, and as we fill our swear jar and we come to a point, each month we will try and empty that swear jar to buy gear to raffle off to you guys, the fans, if – you right now are an inaugural once a duck VIP. So listen earlier in the episode, if you didn't already catch up how you can be one now, but Oh, fantastic interview. And for a guy that breaks down the film, it sure inspired me to get down and explain even more film clips for you guys this week, because last week we only went with one Sam. What, what, what do you think we should go with this week? Should we go to uh, Jeff's Instagram first to give the people an idea of what they're missing out on? You know what, Nick? I like that idea a lot. Give them a little taste of what Jeff's got. Then maybe after that, we can show them a little bit of what the, uh, what the Ducks got going historically as well as now. So I got to say, here's the first reason you guys should all be following at Jeff Schwartz uh, on Twitter or especially Instagram is for plays like this. He goes and finds the pancakes you might be missing. And oh my goodness, Terrence Ferguson right there coming down, helping George Moore lay down the defensive end. And George is just going to give him that extra little tap at the end. And uh, usually Jeff gives us a little uh, verbal communication. To, there's nothing more to explain here but to say, man, pancakes for days, Sam. How do you feel about that? I just want to point something out. Tell me if I'm mistaken or not. Terrence Ferguson's a freshman. Yeah, That is an 18-year-old somehow barely not a child absolutely turning somebody into a flapjack you would pray somebody would make for you on a Sunday morning what I love even more is it's done all because he's hesitating to do a twist and this guy now has to use him as an agility bag and jump over him like it's a drill to try it but no redirect (laughs) I I absolutely love plays like that and man That's what gets me fired up for football because, oh, you never know who's going to lay a big hit. And when a freshman goes out there and does it, woo, gets me fired up as an offensive lineman. Those are the kind of things we want. Cakes for days, and you can find them on Jeff Short's Twitter. Now, something else we talked about with Jeff is that 2007 Michigan game. And, man, we have to go back and review that. So, Here we go. Let's bring up the play. Let's talk about the Statue of Liberty. So we've got Nick. I thought we were going to talk about the Jason Williams touchdown. We're talking about the Statue of Liberty. (laughs) Yes, sir. This is the one. This is the one everyone remembers from the Michigan game, even though there were a lot of players like Jeff said, this is the one that stands out, even though as an offensive lineman to you, it always feels the same. But what we're looking at here is a very even set. So it forces the defense to establish which side they want to make their strength. So right here, We have a nose tackle right there lined up in the one technique on Max Unger's left side. And we've got the three technique over here on Mark Lewis and our good friend Jeff Schwartz is at right tackle here with the defensive end on him. Now, for the offensive line, they may not even know what is going on in the backfield here for the routine, but it could essentially work just like a standard zone read where the running back is crossing this way and the quarterback reads the backside defensive end. But here, let's just watch and see what they do and how they set this up the first time to handing it off with Jonathan Stewart. Boom. Perfect fake. And Stu just takes it outside. But look at the finish from the offensive lineman downfield. Those guys are throwing extra blocks to get those extra yards, which we want to see against Ohio State. Now, as we go back. I love that Schwartz is taking this defensive end and making it so that we're reading one of the linebackers and keeping our quarterback safe on this route here. But go ahead. It gives him that extra little bit of time. And I think, Sam, you have a a very important defensive player for Michigan you'd like to point out, so I'll let it roll. What we should probably do is take it back to the beginning of this play because your Zoom started glitching and we couldn't hear what you said for the majority of that description. Oh, no. So – so just take we'll it back go. to like breaking down the second play, and then we'll we can, we'll cut it together. Yeah. From so, right there. so as we start here, we have the same exact formation. Even it keeps the defense in the same position, and we see that they have the nose tackle here in the same exact spot. So they're already set up. They've seen this play happen going to the left side to Jonathan Stewart, but instead, this time, Dennis Dixon holds the ball. Jace Stu runs around and. 
your favorite player, 94, completely gets turned around by Mark Lewis. Let's watch it again. Easy walk in. Mark Lewis barely has to touch him the second time. What's your favorite part about this play, Sam? Well, besides the fact that 94 doesn't have an idea of where the ball is until it is literally past his own body, what I really like about the play, honestly, is how simplistic the design is or how simplistic the setup is. You have the exact same formation you had, not just on the Statue of Liberty play, but on several plays before on the drive. It's one thing that made the Oregon offense these times so successful is that you could do so many out of just these simple formations. Another thing here that's just so worth talking about, besides the pure ability of Jonathan Stewart and Dennis Dixon just to make this happen in the first place, is the understanding of what's going on right here. You see the lane opened up, almost bridging out to the left that way. Dennis takes his time, though. He has the perception to be able to wait a second, wait for that right side to open it up. It opens up very cleanly. Just seconds later, he's able to take it to the end zone. It's a beautiful play, and this is a game that if you're an Oregon Duck fan who maybe is a little bit more recent to the table, maybe you're trying to learn a little bit about Oregon history, go find this one, rewatch this game. You'll learn a lot in just about two and a half hours about Oregon football. And what I really love about it is, look, you look, and Chip used to teach us, is if the pull is there and open, whether the running back is going behind you for this fantastic fake by Dennis, or if he's coming in front of you like a typical mesh on his own read, look, all the quarterback has to do is pull the ball. And if this one-on-one -on -one opportunity isn't a broken tackle for you, get down. That's ultimately all you have to do. And Anthony Brown could take note of this because at Ohio State, those linebackers are going to hit you hard. And even worse, if you stay up and try and make a second or third move, those defensive linemen are going to be following. So at Ohio State, you want to don't want to deal with that. So if you see this hash mark, you can't quite get the same angle because the linebackers aren't bumping into each other like that. Maybe just go ahead, take a moment and just get down. And I think there's times where instead of leaning forward, you can actually, especially with the new targeting rules that they're really, really reinforcing, you can just go ahead and take a slide and that's going to get you your 15 yards, even if you don't get the first down. So what do you think about that play, Sam? Uh, how, do, how do you remember it? Where were you in 2007 when the University of Oregon was at the big house? You know what, Nick? This is tough. This is right in that range where I was, become, I was becoming aware of Oregon football. You have to remember, I was born in 98. So this, I was nine years old at the time. I was aware of Oregon football. I knew what it was. I knew that I liked it, but I, I wasn't necessarily getting up every Saturday and going, no, I'd rather watch football than cartoons right now. That wasn't really what was going on. But what I can tell you is that this game was huge for Oregon football and that, as Jeff mentioned, this was the season coming after a very tough bowl loss to BYU the Ducks were able to take care of business against Houston, take care of business at Michigan, and really were able to unroll what was a phenomenal season before, as we all know, Dennis Dixon injuries, yada, 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 things don't go the way it's planned. This is an important time for Oregon football, though, and this will always be a time in Oregon football that means something to me. I know for a fact that games from this, time, this era are some of my first Oregon football memories. There's some really fun things to be able to look back on, and I mentioned it earlier, but Please, if you get a chance, go rewatch this game. Go rewatch a lot of fun old Oregon games. It's a, it's a really enjoyable time, but this is another one that maybe just for the disappointed Michigan fans having to face two losses in back-to-back -back weeks they didn't think they were going to get, it's a really fun watch. Well, and I remember my hype as a recruit going into this game. I'd come off that Houston game that was my first game in Austin. I just thought this was the greatest experience ever, and if this team can go and capitalize on the, the weaknesses that Appalachian State exposed – at the University of Michigan, I was really hopeful and excited that they'd go in there and kick ass, and they did. And I'm hoping that Minnesota exploited a lot of weaknesses for the Buckeyes that the Ducks can take advantage of, because you know what? Honestly, looking at their game, they didn't look perfect either. I'm certainly worried about the game. I'm a little concerned, but man, I know this team can do it the way they're built right now. I think sometimes they play down to some of their opponents, but Certainly one play where they did not was when they had to finish and Anthony Brown ran it in for that last touchdown. Let's go ahead and go back to Jeff Schwartz on Twitter to just analyze this last play that, uh, you know, really meant everything in the game. So who's the guy that stands out for you here, Sam, as we watch it through? Well, I think it's pretty clear. George Moore right here. He's just able to absolutely take care of business. Big block there, able to hit another guy. 
even gets his body out in front of a third player just to make sure he's able to bring him down there. After that, it's all Anthony Brown. Good decision-making, finding the open lanes, getting to the end zone. Autzen Stadium, I've been waiting to hear it roar for a long time, and it roared when Anthony Brown made it into the end zone on Saturday. Yeah, and what we're running here right now is our basic speed option play. So the quarterback's going to pull. It gives your running back an opportunity to go out as the pitch man. And what it is is a great counter, especially in the pistol, because everybody's playing your front side, just hand off zone read, that kind of thing. This is the great opportunity. And when we got Marcus Mariota early in his freshman season going, this was a great play that we had, especially in the red zone, to try and just get us a touchdown because we knew what a great decision maker Marcus was with the ball in his hands running. So right here, Anthony Brown makes a great decision. And as you said, George Moore, man, this is the finish we need to see every single play he does not let his feet stop until the man is going down and he's following it going get his hat boom he is not making the play and great last cut by anthony brown man that was a fantastic play and it was so fantastic to be there gotta thank at raven ducks again because again without our fantastic ducks fans here at once a duck i wouldn't have been there i know you would still be there but it just gave me that that hope again and even though the game didn't turn out how I think most of us expected, uh, we were coming home. I got to pick this jersey or shirt up, and it just it gave me brand new life as we, we left, and me and at Raven Ducks just came home, experienced that win, and started to dissect all the things going on in the Pac-12 this season. I am extremely hopeful, but oh, before we get into our predictions, I just want to thank everybody that's contributed because last week – it was incredible, not just with those that are donors or watching the episode, but those that came up to us at the game. I don't know about you, Sam, but I had so many people come up to me, even other former Ducks that we may have on the show later this season that were just like, hey, love what you're doing. Keep it up. And that support is always appreciated. And I've directed all those people to let us know in the comments what they want to see, what Duck guests they want to see, because the fans are really the best opinion we can get. And that's who we are here to serve. That's what we're trying to format our show for. And if you like our show, just subscribe, share with your friends, like everything you can do to contribute. It's appreciated tenfold. Nick, you're absolutely right. Uh, you, you are slightly more recognizable an individual than I am. So when we're rolling around in public spaces, you, you probably do get noticed a little bit more. Likely because you're casting a shadow over whoever you're walking in front of. That's possibly why. Um, truthfully, it was just so much fun to be back in that atmosphere. I can't thank everybody who, who's willing to contribute, willing to even just give us views and listens. It's so helpful. It, it, it makes us want to keep doing it every week. It's so nice to see. Honestly, I know we're about to get into score predictions. It's going to be, a, uh, it's gonna be a, a, a fun prediction. Let's just say that much. Uh, before that, though, of course, you can follow Nick at just follow 61, follow myself at Samuel 101 TS and follow at once a duck wherever you get your podcasts. Nick, I know you got something for the people, so I'll give it a quick breakdown really quick unless you got something to set us up with real quick. Well, and again, if you're looking to donate right now, our inaugural VIPs, if you donate in September before our October episodes, five dollars, that's all it is, helps us get our, you know. Fees paid off to make this show run and we'll contribute everything extra back to you. We always appreciate it. And, you know, once a duck is where you're going to find us on Venmo or cash app, if you're going to look to make that donation. And yeah, I'm excited about this game. I'm, I'm trying to be optimistic. I don't know how you feel about it, but that's what we end the show on predictions for. So Sam, what do you have predicted for us? Well, Nick, I think, as I said, as I said last week, I'm somebody who, who looks at life in, in going one of two ways, and I think a lot of time it does do that. I think that this game isn't unwinnable by any means for the Oregon Ducks, but truthfully, it is a game that's going to be very difficult, and I think something that's very true is that if Oregon wins this game, and it's something you brought up earlier, it's going to have to be ugly. It would be ugly if Oregon were to win this game. I think that the version of reality that I think we see is one where Oregon maybe isn't as lucky, but I think it leads to a phenomenal football game. I think we're going to get one of the best football games of the college football season. As Jeff mentioned, Oregon's really good at playing up to opponents. I think Ohio State might just have a little bit more experience in these big games. I'll give it to them 41 to 35. I think it's going to be a really good ball game. One thing I will say, if the Ducks are going to win this game, it's going to rely on one guy with special teams, 
Tom Sneed. He was on the Ray Guy Award list for week one. He played a phenomenal game, including a 56-yard punt. Field position is going to be huge. If the Ducks get a win, that's going to be exceptionally necessary. Well, man, sure is tough. We're supposed to be homers here once a Duck, I thought. And uh, you know what, Sam? I don't necessarily disagree with any of your points, but I just really want to end this episode on a higher note because it was a great episode, great interview. I thought everything uh, is lining up for the podcast. And after our last episode, I, I think fans are really excited, but I think I got to close it out at least with my prediction in the form of a song. Sam sees a bad game arising. Sam sees trouble on the way. I see ducks and bugs are fighting. Someone will see bad time Saturday. Ducks better keep it tight. And Sam hopes he isn't right. I see buff guys home demise. Honestly, we're going ugly game. Ducks win 17 13. I apologize for being out of key. I can't sing. I can't play guitar, but I can make predictions. Ducks win it in the horseshoe. Go, Duckies. What do you think, Sam? Nick, I hope you're right. I. I, I don't mind being wrong. I like being wrong. I hope I'm wrong this week. I put myself in the position where if I'm sad, at least I'm right. If I'm wrong, at least I'm happy. Let's see how this one goes. Give the people what they need to know and let's get out of here. Well, if we lose it, I'll never play a song on this podcast again and save all of you that, Ugh. that detriment there. I apologize. Had to get it out. That's the only reason I, I you know, had to, had to try and bring our energy back up. And if it didn't work out, then we get rid of it not to believe in superstition, but tradition. We will introduce a new tradition that our fancy fit. And again, we hope that you like guys like this podcast and go back and listen to our other ones. If you haven't already like subscribe, donate to once a duck, if you want to. And uh, man, once a duck, always a duck. We have another great guest for you next week. Not going to tease it too much. Keep following us on Twitter, but if you guess it right, as always, we'll give you a plug in the next episode. Sam, anything to leave the people with? For myself, for Cody Hendricks, have a good one, folks. Go Ducks! <laughs>